One of the features of angle resolved data are the large numbers of spectra that can be acquired from the same sample. This sample is a, a silicon wafer with a native oxide layer and by tilting the sample either using the lens system to achieve this or by physically tilting the sample using a stage has resulted in a set of silicon 2p spectra which exhibit both elemental silicon which you'd expect and an oxide peak and because we have significant numbers of spectra to look at it's possible to do a number of data treatments that will show that these data actually consist of the elemental and two different forms of silicon oxide. While we believe there are two different forms of oxide within these data, the highly correlated nature of the oxide peak makes it quite difficult to create a peak model and have a high degree of confidence that you really have proportioned the, the silicon dioxide from the SI203 signal and so what we're going to do is perform some data treatments that will ultimately lead to a means of constructing a peak model where we can identify these two oxide states from the data itself and in order to do this we need to first of all calibrate the spectra and align the silicon the elemental silicon anyway because this ought to be in the same position in binding energy for all of these data. The peak model was propagated from a silicon 2p spectrum that had been calibrated and the data set has not been calibrated in terms of binding energy so before we can fit the peak model to these data what we need to do is perform a rough calibration based on a range that is to say you calculate a peak maximum using an energy interval and then you shift all the spectra um, we won't shift the components because we've, we've already positioned the components with respect to the the binding energy scale by virtue of the original peak model so we're going to shift all the data so that the data align with the peak model and once we've done this we can then propagate a peak fit so that we then fit all of these data so, and the idea is to get the elemental peak in the correct position using the, the doublet peak and then we can create a new file that contains the calibrated spectra where they've all been aligned for the silicon 2p elemental doublet. Now the reason that we're doing these calculations is to end up with a set of spectra that can be treated as vectors and any PCA type calculation requires data bins to align because they're going to be treated as coordinates in a vector so the next step is to interpolate all of the spectra that were shifted and then copied to a new file using the energy calibration what we've done is interpolated so that the same data bins, the equivalent data bins, are now present in all of these VAMAS blocks and so we can now perform a principal component analysis to, to look at what kind of abstract factors are within the data set as a whole. The idea of the abstract factors is to see how many different shapes are within these data and you can see here we've got one that looks like the spectrum that's the typical one for silicon 2p with oxide and then we have two more that represent shapes that are associated with the oxide so we've got three abstract factors and if we reproduce the data set using three abstract factors we will have removed noise from the entire data set and leave ourselves with a set of vectors which we can do further vector manipulation on and we'll have removed the noise and this is one of the key features of the principal component analysis for the next step which is looking at different spectra. If we use the raw data the noise when you do different spectra tends to be amplified so we really need to remove as much noise as possible before we attempt to do these different spectra. So the different spectra are calculated on the calculated property page and the idea is to identify two spectra that will give us some complementary information and uh, 
in this case what we're, we've selected are two spectra that have a similar oxide but different intensities for the elemental peak and the reason for choosing these is because if we take the difference of these spectra and we search through this list we can end up with a silicon 2p elemental doublet without any oxide and that's a that's the first obvious component to search for within this data set now you can see within this same calculation there is evidence of a of a of the oxide peak that is much more intense compared to a uh, the elemental peak and you'll notice the elemental peak is looks relatively noisy compared to the oxide and that that's because the intensity of the sil elemental silicon because of poisson statistics uh, means that you would expect to see a lot more noise around the s elemental peak than the oxide. So we'll copy these two and put them back into the file that we had constructed, that is to say a file that contains the PCA enhanced spectra that have all been energy calibrated. And now we're going to look for another pair and the idea of this second pair is that we're going to try and look for a, a pair of spectra where we can have similar elemental intensity with some variation in the oxide. And this sometimes takes a bit of time to work out which spectra you ought to use. But if we're lucky, and we have been here, we've got two spectra that have very similar intensities in terms of the elemental peak, but a difference in the oxide peak. So again using the difference spectra approach we, we end up with a, a list of spectra that we can then search through and with a bit of luck we should be able to identify two different forms of oxide here. The elemental peak should always be in the same position so we can pay attention to the oxide peak and, and try and come up with a spectrum that has some sort of oxide shape that seems reasonable and here's one so we'll we'll copy that one and then we'll go and search for the opposite the complementary form of of this oxide so hopefully as you can see here a a second form of oxide appears and we don't necessarily have to identify uh, this oxide all on its own we can we can actually allow a bit of the elemental to come back in order to obtain a a better shape in the oxide peak and there's a certain trial and error here trying to work out what will be best for the overall calculation and you may have to repeat this several times before you get it right so having identified two shapes if we overlay them we can just look at them and you can clearly see there's a an oxide with a significant shift so that is suggesting a different chemical state because the elemental positions seem to be the same and once again you, you can see that the elemental silicon peak has noise within it, it which is again characteristic of the Poisson statistics when you have two intense peaks so fortunately we have the elemental peak that we identified first and the one that need a little bit more work is the the spectrum that looks like it's going to be the SI203 and if we take that spectrum and the elemental peak that was isolated we can then work through a difference list and try and identify or rather amplify the the oxide peak compared to the elemental. The idea is that you would like to end up with three spectral forms that in terms of vectors have as wide an angles between them as possible. Ideally they should all be orthogonal but that's not going to be very likely because we have the, the elemental peak in all of these data and the idea is to actually limit the amount of elemental but maintain enough so that we can keep the shapes for the oxides uh, without too much noise as well that is so having identified a a new spectrum that w might be the SI203 we'll copy that one back into the file containing the data and then what we'll do 
is we will display in the active tile the three component spectra that we believe to be the elemental SiO2 and SiO3 and there will be some combination of both of the or rather of all of these states um, and but at least in the first instance what we want to do is reconstruct all of the spectra using these three shapes and the sanity check is to go through and apply a linearly squares fit of the, your component shapes to the data set that you used in the calculation and the idea is that they should fit very well and they do fit very well which is not surprising because we constructed the entire data set using three abstract factors which means that the set of silicon 2p spectra could have no more than three dimensions within them hence three vectors fit the data very well but the real acid test is to go back to the spectra where it has full dimension that's to say you've got noise within the data and perform the same calculation so we'll reset all of the spectra that were we'll keep the energy calibration that's the the file that we've chosen but we'll reset the principal component analysis data noise reduction and then we'll perform the same calculation where we'll overlay the three different components in the active tile select the spectra and then perform a linear least squares decomposition and then again look through the data and see how well these reproduce the data when we've got a full dimensional data set and they're doing a reasonable job the green spectrum is the approximation the red spectrum is the original data so you can see that the calculated least squares solution is doing rather well we can having obtained a reasonably well uh, described data set in terms of these three vectors what we can now do is construct peak models based on the component spectra that we've just calculated so we need to use a, a background I was just calculating or loading the background type from the previously prepared peak model so that this is appropriate for uh, silicon 2p elemental and oxide data and then having propagated this to the other two component spectra what I'm going to do is create silicon 2p doublets that apply to these individual components so I must have two doublets for each of these oxide and the elemental that you can see because we've got some elemental we must accommodate that also but we can first of all create a a simple peak model for the elemental form from the, the first component which was just simply the elemental peak so two peaks and they should be in the ratio two to one and we can say fit and then we can use this as a as an estimate of what the offset and the full width half maximum might need to be for these silicon 2p peaks we'll enter names so that we know what they are so SI2P elemental for the component names we'll just set the offset in the position and the factor in the full width half maximum copy them and then paste into the next component spectrum and we'll just use the paste replace to scale the data and then we'll do a little bit of manipulation here uh, copying and pasting and ultimately we should end up with a pair of doublets one rep representing the oxide and the other the elemental peak and so the trick is to copy and paste paste replace to, to end up with a single component which we can easily then move into the elemental so we've got now a doublet in both of these peaks and we can fit them let's just give the right name so silicon SiO2 that is and then 
copying and pasting into the next one this is where we think it's the SI203 so it's not surprising that there's a shift in the oxide the elemental is in the right position so we'll move that so we'll fit these and then we need to just adjust the names because we've got SiO2 right now that's going to be SI203 well, names are used in quantification so these are useful when you put up quantification tables and say fit and then having organized a model on each one of these separate spectra we can now construct a peak model based on those component spectra for the, the data itself and the data itself that's in the first column in this file so we'll put a, a region on and then we'll go in turn to each one of these component spectra that we've used in the least squares calculation and we'll copy and paste into the spectrum itself and because these spectra were all proportioned using the linear least squares when you copy and paste the components not surprising that actually they fit the data very well with the exception that each one of these spectra has an elemental doublet within it so what we're going to do is now just delete the additional elemental doublets that were copied from the oxide the two forms of the oxide that had a small component of elemental in it so we're going to remove those and just rely on the elemental doublet that we we have created from the one component to represent the elemental silicon 2p so when we well before we fit we'll just lock all these components in place because we know they ought to be in the, the right place because the least squares fit uh, was uh, has really determined the offsets for them so if we say lock all for the position and the fourth half maximum we can fit and obtain a good peak model and then just for quantification and display purposes we'll set the component index to be 0 for the elemental, 1 for the SiO2 and 2 for the Si203 and this will allow us to use some of the display options we can use an annotation table and on the components there's a add component index table what that does is it adds together intensities from components with the same component index so we get a proportion of elemental to SiO2 to SI203 and then similarly we can display the spectra using the component indices so we get a, set, a, a common color and once we've got a peak model and we have other spectra with which for which this peak model must apply we can propagate the peak model and the annotation and then we end up with a set of spectra all of which have been fitted so the propagation applies to the selected spectra so we've only done it for the first file effectively the one with the experimental variable of zero and these represent angular changes in the measurement between zero and minus eight and so we've ended up with a, a decomposition of these silicon 2p and a peak model that we can feel confident with.